Good evening, everyone. Ah, uh, thank you. I'm Harry Elam. I'm the Vice President for the Arts at Stanford. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second event in our series, Artists on the Future. This series seeks to bring together in meaningful conversation significant artists and thought leaders around issues critical to our future. The series starts with the simple and evocative premise that arts matter and that there is a profound power in arts practice, arts thinking, arts knowing. As such, art can and has played a vital role in the construction of citizenship, justice, democracy. In his Nancy Hanks lecture on arts and public policy, Darren Walker, one of our guests tonight, said this of art, quote, art is not a privilege. Art is the soul of our civilization, the beating heart of our humanity, a miracle to which we all should bear witness over and over again in every home, from the most modest and humble to the grandest and well-fashioned. And tonight, in this place, our National Cathedral to the Arts, and in this moment, this perilous and changing times in our nation's history, I would argue that we need the arts and humanities more than ever." End of quote. This idea that arts are needed now more than ever permeates this series and our thoughts on the future of arts here at Stanford. In fact, as my colleague Peggy Phelan has argued, quote, the future of Stanford is tied directly to the arts. We are on the precipice of a profound revolution in what and how we think and who gets to think as machine learning conquers every amore of what humans have called thinking, education will require fluency across and access to modes of being and expression that surpass computational logic and explore what it means to be human. Art becomes crucial, for as both its proponents and detractors know, art is in the arena in which passion, thought, and the human drama go beyond that which is known, logical, and calculable. Thus, this series determines to position art not as tangential, but rather central to the debate and discussion of our future. Arts matter. Here at Stanford and other institutions of higher learning, the specific experiential aspects of the arts practice uh, make significant uh, component of student learning, becomes a significant component of student learning. Art matters in linking learning in the classroom to real life problems outside. The concept of art matters also posits that there are certain issues and questions, certain ways of thinking and doing that lie in the particular purview of the arts. Engaging in arts thinking can provide novel, innovative approaches to problem solving, for arts thinking connotes a process not only on any particular product. It is a way of exploring the freedom of connections that reach across disciplines and differences as art thinking offers a way of organizing and acquiring knowledge. As tonight's discussion will testify the arts matter today and help can, can help us think about our future. Now before I go any further today, I wanna first say thank you to Ellen O oh and all of her staff for making this evening possible in terms of her work. And now I want to introduce and first thank Kamal Shah and Gaurav Garg for supporting this conversation series and making it possible. So please join me in welcoming Kamal Shah to the stage. Where is Kamal? <laughs> Welcome. I actually can't see most of you, but it is, as my speech dictates, it is a pleasure to see many familiar faces and also many new friends to our talk today. At the last talk in March, we witnessed an unprecedented and candid conversation around some very tough issues of representation and cultural appropriation between Dana Schutz and Hamza Walker. Since then, I'm happy to report um, Dana has gotten, gone to set new auction records with a work selling for nearly two and a half million dollars. And Hamza was a judge for the 2019 Venice Biennale. Now, in about five months from now, we look forward to welcoming the legendary and fiery Linda Benglis and social media phenom and activist Kimberly Drew, also known as Museum Mammy, on October 22nd. So please mark your calendars. 
I trained as a computer scientist at Stanford um, in the early 90s. Being young and ambitious, I wanted to be perfect and then some more, just to prove that women could succeed in the tech world. But over the last 28 years, it has also become clear that society places an extra heavy burden on women and people of color to succeed in almost all disciplines of life. A recent article from The Economist, this is the mid-May um, report. A recent article reports that art made by women sells for an average 42% less compared to works by men. The study used a sample size of not 1,000 or 10,000, but 1.9 million works across 49 countries between 1970 to 2016. So you know, you might wonder if maybe women are just less talented or that they use mundane or perhaps somewhat feminine themes in their work. To investigate this, the researchers then used a computer program to generate paintings and randomly assigned male or female names to these works. Any guesses on the learnings? The experiment found that the population that is likely to bid at auctions attributed a lower value to, these, to those works that were associated with a female name. In other words, the discount has nothing to do with talent or the theme of the work. It is solely based on the fact that they are female. This conversation series enters into this global bias by aspiring to shine a light on these structural barriers in our society and incite not just conversations, but also activism. You in the audience come from either the art or the tech world, both of which are the most powerful medium to impact change, or your students here who will make that change towards a more equitable future. To spur you into driving change today, we are so thrilled to bring you the absolute best thought leaders, Lorna Simpson, a multimedia virtuoso, and a dear friend, whose work certainly challenges us to think about the society we live in. And Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation and the Times 100 change whisperer to the entire world. Let me now turn over to Harry to introduce them. Thank you, Kamal. And now for this, the second talk in our series at Stanford, Lorna Simpson and Darren Walker will discuss topics around social justice in, and the arts. Uh, Simpson's pioneering multimedia work reflects her concerns about the nature of representation, race, gender, and identity in contemporary culture. Darren Walker leads the Forge Foundation's mission to advance human welfare. First, let's welcome them to the stage. Uh, Lorna came to prominence in the 1980s with her pioneering approach to conceptual photography. Simpson's early work, particularly her striking juxtapositions of text and stage Im images, raised questions about the nature of representation, identity, gender, race, and history that continue to drive the artist's expanding and multidisciplinary practice today. She deftly explores the medium's umbilical relationship to memory and history, both central themes within her work. Her works have been exhibited and are in collections at the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and amongst many others. Important international exhibits have included the Hugo Boss Prize at the Guggenheim Museum and New York Documenta II in Kessel, Germany, and the 56th Venice Biennale in Venice, Italy. Darren Walker is president of the Ford Foundation and an international social justice uh, philanthropy with a, a 13 billion endowment and six million in annual grant making. For two decades, he has been a leader in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. 
Darren led the philanthropy committee that helped bring a resolution to the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy and chairs the U.S. Alliance on Impact Investing. He co-chairs New York City's Commission on City Art, Monuments and Markers, and serves on the Commission on the Future of Rikers Island's Correctional Institution and the UN International Labor Organization's Commission on the Future of Work. He also serves on the board of Carnegie Hall, the High Line, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome, you two. <laughs> So there will be time at the end for uh, some question and answers, and you got cards uh, earlier in as you came in, and if you have a question, you'll be able to pass it to someone in the aisle, and we'll work with those questions later for Darren and Lorna. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am so thrilled to have made my way across the country to this magical place called Palo Alto <laughs> and this otherworldly college campus called Stanford mm. to be with all of you and a shero of mine, Lorna Simpson, who of course, as you all know, <laughs> is one of the great creative geniuses of our time. My dear Lorna, we were just together in Venice. We were. <laughs> and I, over dinner, marveled at you as you were interrogated by everyone who wanted to talk to you about your work. I'm curious for you to share mm -hmm. how you think about your practice as an artist. So much of your work has been about identity, gender, race, issues of justice and injustice in society. How did you and how do you think about an artistic practice and an arc? Because you didn't just show up yesterday. No. You've been doing <laughs> this for some time and you were doing it before you were, yes, you were always Lorna Simpson but you weren't Lorna Simpson. <laughs> because today you're Lorna Simpson. <laughs> so oh, talk about that. Um, you know, things have changed. I'm older, and, um, but I was, had the benefit of growing up. And I, I just want to say it is such an honor to be here, Darren, with you. And thank you so much for the invitation and the coordination to bring us both here. Um, so I, I am kind of starstruck by Darren, and I've known him uh, for so many years, but um, such huge appreciation for what you do. But I grew up going to public school uh, in the 60s, which is a different world than what we have now. I learned how to play the violin. I could learn how to play the cello, or I learned ballet. I mean, uh, the number of opportunities as a child, although living in New York and having parents who love the arts, um, there was a lot for me to choose from and a lot for me to consider as a child of just, do I like the violin? Do I don't? And I think now in terms of the educational system as it stands now in terms of public schools is bereft of that opportunity. And that it is, of course, I mean, uh, the palace that is Stanford University is amazing and all the resources that are going towards this institution and the aim uh, that you're making. But to have young people who are entering this institution who have never really had any consistent contact with the arts is an issue because they then arrive here and then the question of, you know, of, of uh, having the uh, impetus for self-expression is one that is a hurdle. I can say that I've been an artist since I was a child because I had that opportunity of understanding myself artistically and what I liked and what I didn't like from a very young age. But imagine being presented and being in college never having really the experience of self-expression uh, and having to kind of make that leap. Um, so I would say in some ways I am extremely, extremely lucky in that respect. 
as I look back on how is it that I got to this point or how did I get to my, like at 17 years old, knowing what I wanted to do? Well, I think it's interesting that you, as you say, students arrive today, mm -hmm. but let's be really clear, the inequality in our system, middle class, primarily white students are turning up knowing about the arts because they still have it. So, right. because their parents can afford. Right. And so what we see is the gap today, as you say, when you were a child, the public schools had the arts, but today that's not the case. Right. But parents who can still afford. True. To their send children, their children, their children to are private exposed, which is one of the real issues so. around, around arts education when people say there's not arts education anymore. There's arts education. Yeah. The, arts ed the kids who are being educated are the kids who have parents right. who can make sure that they still see museums, that they still they can afford tickets to the theater. Mm -hmm. And so those kids arrive at Stanford prepared. Right. The kids who have a hard time are the very kids who are most vulnerable, right? Because they actually haven't had it in their public schools. And so it is another way in which the inequality in our systems, and I think one of the things that uh, a school like Stanford can do, and certainly when you've got patrons like Kamal and Garav, you can get behind funding these projects that make the arts more accessible, which is something you've been about. Right. In part because artists have always been on the front lines of social justice. And it's something that I can say about you having watched your career over these many years, this notion that you are engaged on issues of justice. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um. Primarily because I was uh, raised by, my father was Cuban and Jamaican and my mother was from Chicago. They both arrived to New York out of their appreciation for the arts. But they were also, my father was a social worker um, for teenage boys who were in foster care or had just gotten out of juvenile detention in the Bronx. So I think um, my day to day in terms of certainly my father's profession and his concerns and his frustrations uh, with uh, social services in New York and kind of the impossibility of being able to keep track of the whereabouts of these young children uh, through a uh, government system that was inadequate was very clear to me at a very young age, and they were, um, throughout my childhood, um, politically active. So I think, um, and the books that we had at home and the, the library that they had was all about African-American history and history of Africa and kind of the politics. I mean, I think I was well-versed in 60s politics by the time I was like 14 years old. Um, so. I, I think it was an interesting mix of who my parents were as people and their concerns in terms of uh, the professions that they did. My mother was a uh, secretary for surgeons at Beekman Downtown Hospital in Lower Manhattan. So issues of health care also came into the kind of uh, conversation about the work that they were doing. Um, and there was always lively conversation at home in terms of family around politics, meaning that um, either you know, half the conversations were in Spanish, half the conversations were in English, or with the uh, Jamaican side of my family, kind of what it was like as immigrants to live in the United States. Um, and having left uh, just as uh, Castro was taking uh, power. So all of those family stories and kind of um, the navigation of living in America, either the side of my family uh, that is kind of from New Orleans in the South uh, and migrated to Chicago, or the other side of my family, which immigrants from the Caribbean that came to the United States, it gave me a very rich sense of what we call American culture, what is black American culture, what is Caribbean culture. And so in that way, my sense of what identity was was always uh, multifaceted in a way against the backdrop of what it means to be living in America. 
And did you intend to be the kind of artist you are? I mean, did you start out saying, I'm going to be an artist who is in every museum. <laughs> My prices are going to be, I'm going <laughs> to kick Cindy Sherman that I'm going to, I mean, did you start out no. this ambitious black woman? No, but you know, I was ambitious for some reason. Um, I think when I began, because of my family history and, and living in New York, and I went to art high school, I went to the High School of Art and Design in like the middle of Manhattan. And so it was, they also had an international program. So I went to school with children from all over New York. You know, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Staten Island, everywhere, Upper East Side, Lower East Side. And by the time I got, to, that were all artists, by the time I got to college, and going to art history classes where there would be, oh, oh, there's a black photographer named Roy de Caraver, or, you know, like, in each art history class, the mention of anyone who was not white was kind of very limited, which I knew was ridiculous. I just felt like my New York experience told me that wasn't true. So within the first few months of being at, um, School of Visual Arts, I decided to go to, I, I met friends who lived in Harlem, and I was spending a lot of time in Harlem, came across the Studio Museum in Harlem again, because my parents had taken me there, and I applied for a, a residence, uh, a, what is it, um, internship in the education department. So I really sought out, um, kind of institutionally in New York, and I think that comes from growing up in New York, and kind of at a very young age, feeling some ownership or access, um, and went to the Studio Museum, and I got an internship where I met Kelly Jones, uh, who was interning as a curate in, in the curatorial department and was studying art history at Amherst. Um, and so I created a world for myself that was a reflection of the world that I came from, in a way, in terms of its diversity. And but did you do that in order to make you more resilient, to insulate yourself I, I from that, the racism no. of the art? art I of did the that arts? to learn more. Because I knew, as a young person, like, okay, I don't know a lot, but I know there's a lot more out there than what the school is offering me. Um, and so while I was an intern at the Studio Museum, David Hammonds was an artist in residence at that time. And many art, and kind of I came into contact with a range of artists, and it kind of validated my idea, like, yeah, the school doesn't know anything about what's going on. Um, which took me to Linda Good Bryant's exhibition programs at Just Above Midtown and the different artists that she collaborated with and showed work. Um, but these artists, I mean, you make this sound so normative, but <laughs> let's really uh, talk about the context mm. for art criticism, for auction prices, for determining who received attention and who didn't. Because that during that very time, which we right. see today reflected very much in the Soul of a Nation exhibition, right. uh, black artists and certainly black women artists mm -hmm. were completely marginalized. Right. I mean, it, it's so... I would imagine that um, part of what you were doing was constructing a world that you wanted to see and that mm -hmm. a world and surrounding yourself with people who looked like you who were excellent. True, and also um, I just had a sense that there was more out there um, and I thought it was important uh, I don't know, I, I think I was a very aggressive young woman. But I think it also came out of, um, there was some point maybe in my first year of college that I went to like a heresies meeting and kind of these feminist meetings in the late 70s. So at 18 years old, I would sit in these feminist meetings and given going to high school in the late 70s, which is kind of the end of the sexual revolution with a bunch of young people who are artists, 
it seems so antiquated to me that they didn't have any understanding of, you know, in these feminist meetings, it was predominantly white women. There was no understanding about sexuality. There was no mention of Audre Lorde. There was no, no kind of expansiveness within that community in talking, literally they were talking feminism, but not about sexuality. And so for me, I kind of saw generationally that, oh, I come from a completely different generation. Like we've already done that. You guys, are, I, I, I just couldn't understand, and I know this sounds like ancient long ago now, but I couldn't understand at 18 in 1978 where they were at in terms of talking about feminism. And so there was always these, I, I kind of would find myself in these generational slippy, slippery slope moments of not feeling quite in line with a lot of that thought and felt the need to really educate myself and understand that there must be, because my experience as a young person was quite different. Just right, but your experience, I mean, what you are describing is what Gloria Steinem has talked to me about when she talks about how feminism as it was represented left out yeah. the voices of black women mm -hmm. or that Audre Lorde and others had to fight their way mm -hmm. in or that they were at times in the room. I mean, Gloria has a picture that she loves to show of herself and two other black women who were marching together and what appeared in the New York Times and the AP wire was Gloria, right. was Gloria. Right. And, she, and she had purposely done that to try, but the, but the, the idea that there would be they were uh, women of color right. who were actually leaders of this movement was seemingly impossible for the media and for many other feminists. Right to really be able to engage around. But I was around. also at that time reading Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. So I was really, I mean, literature and um, the context of their writing and kind of the message and, the, and even Zora Neale Hurston at that time was really powerful to me. And I think that just gave me some level of agency to know that there was a different way of looking at this world that was presented to me and uh, ambitiously did so. So what was, for you, the breakthrough moment for Lorna Simpson? What was that? Was it a show and a critical review? No, was I mean, it you a in going back, if we're talking like 1985, I, my graduate school uh, experience at UCSD was really interesting in that it was a time about performance art. Whoopi Goldberg, there's a place called Sushi in San Diego where Whoopi Goldberg came to perform as a performance artist, not as a one woman show and not as the person that you know her to be the actress, actor today. Um, Erica Bogosian, I mean, there was a lot of um, back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast in terms of performers. I personally was not interested in performing, but the, perf the structure and the idea of performing was interesting to me and how that gets translated as a performative action in, within visual art. Um, but at the same time, as a graduate student, which I was saying earlier to some students I was speaking with today, um, I just decided to go to San Diego because I'd gotten out of college early um, and I had met Carrie Mae Weems, who was going to UCSD. And um, in that moment, uh, it was like a rainy October night. You know, it's freezing in New York. I was doing graphic design. That's the analog. worst time to come out it's here. It's And it wasn't even no time. digital, never so move it was back. really hard work. And she said, well, why don't you go to graduate school? And I was like, really? And I didn't even know kind of what graduate school was in terms of art. And I said, well, tell me something about it. And I said, where is it? She goes, San Diego, it's a half an hour from Tijuana. There's a beautiful beach. I was like, interesting. <laughs> I didn't even care who taught, like I knew, knew nothing about um, David Anton, Eleanor Anton, uh, like the, the kind of conceptual art position that enclave that was there knew nothing about that. Went basically on location and uh, uh, geography. 
But when I got there, what was really, again, I mean, I feel like I'm this consummate uh, New Yorker. I got there and people were confusing me for Carrie and this other, and I can't remember her name because I have not seen her in years, another black woman who was a graduate student there. And we would just be interchangeable because we were only black women in a program, um, which we just all kind of, by students and by faculty. And it was just really exhausting. So in that, during that time, my mother was very ill, so I was going back and forth to New York a lot. I would kind of go to class, and my classmates were basic, basically white and from the Midwest or from California. And there, having been uh, the intern, like my experience of New York and the complexity of that, um, I remember one uh, film class where I was, the class was informed like, um, everyone bring a sequence of footage, right? And this is, of course, videotape or film at that moment. And pretend as though, as the class, you have, this is an uh, unedited material by an unknown director, and that we as a class would collaborate and assemble all this material that we would all contribute. Of course, me and my New York self, I found some amazing pictures in some thrift shop in Harlem that are these um, ads for kind of uh, Christmas time. They're almost uh, these very steady, kind of James Van Der Zee, sort of, not James Van Der Zee, but in that realm. Photographs, I'm very proud of myself, like put them in the thing, put them down. And like one of the students, which of course in graduate school, there's, you know, this kind of, um, which. I realized more in graduate school than undergraduate school, this kind of divide between women don't really talk and men do all the talking. Um, so one of the graduate students then looked at me and said, yeah, but if we use your images, that means the director is black. And I, I looked at him, I was like, uh-huh. So what's wrong with that? And like the entire class just couldn't kind of contemplate how to uh, make use and to engage with the images, just images that I, photographic images that I had just uh, like threw into the pot. And so that made me kind of really antisocial from that moment but did on. Did it embolden you to say, actually, the imagery of blackness? It made me understand the power of it. Because being black, and I get up every morning, I look in the mirror as black, the black family, our albums are filled with pictures of black people, for the most part. <laughs> but that was the first time I was like, oh, I understand now. That anything that I do is viewed within a certain kind of way. So I kind of became really antisocial and kind of decided, I'm just gonna do me. And it wasn't until like my thesis project I think, you know, I think as an artist, I am very open. So there are many kinds of artists from all over the world that I can look at someone's work and try to find the kind of universal point in it or, or even the very specifics of what they are doing. But that's not afforded to me. So I just said, I am going to act like my shit is really universal. And everybody's just going to have to deal with that. And that is the way I proceed it with my thesis. And I realized even the professors, like everyone was silent, no one had anything to say. I thought for a minute like, okay, are they gonna fail me? And like, I'm gonna have to be here another three years or two years for a two year program. And basically it's because they didn't know how to deal with it. So I kind of felt like, well, that's interesting. Left, like went back to New York, took that same work, um, back to kind of Kelly Jones and started having conversations with my friends who were on their trajectory in terms of art history and uh, non-for-profit spaces. And immediately the work was embraced. But it's a really interesting point you make about the inability of people to see excellence because they have no capacity to interpret and assess. I mean, I'm reminded of, um, I won't mention her name, but a famous dance critic who, upon seeing Bill T. Jones's first work, the great piece that he did and, and, and premiered at BAM, she wrote... Oh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, yes. She wrote... 
this is not uh, a great work of, of dance. If it is, I just must not have the ability to understand dance anymore. And I thought, well, at least she's honest, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the reality was yeah. this woman had gotten her MFA at Yale and understood Martha Graham and understood mm -hmm. Merce and understood Paul right. Taylor, understood mm -hmm. Balanchine, but she couldn't understand Bill T. Jones. Right. And part of the reason she couldn't understand Bill was because of the ideology of whiteness right. that had been fomented in her that in so many ways made it impossible right. for, him to, for her to see him right. and for her to assess his genius. Right. She literally was unable right. to do it. Although, as you say, Balanchine, American, of Bill course. T. Jones, American. Of course. Yeah. I mean, of course, but the challenge is how, and this is something that has in, certainly infected the art world, and you and Thelma and so many others have fought against this, but the gatekeepers for so long mm -hmm. were people who often literally could not see excellence okay. because they were not in any way prepared to engage it, right. because their training, their credentials, their experience had been validated that that was enough. Had been and and yeah. was not trained to allow them to validate mm -hmm. Bill, mm -hmm. you. True. I mean, right? I mean, and so True. that's what you were experiencing. It wasn't that people were overtly racist or that they were being mean to you. No, it wasn't. I didn't take it personally. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I didn't want to have drinks with them. Right. But I didn't but take it, it but personally. They, but, but it truly was. People were probably silent in right. part because they were saying, what I was do I do with this? was bringing completely different to the table that they had never considered right. before. Correct. Which is, which is one of the challenges for women, for people of color, um, in a, in a system, right? And it's partly why when we look today at the artists who have come unto the fore, mm -hmm. many of whom Pam Joyner and Kamal and people have brought forward, sure. but they were always here. It, it's, you know, it's like I was in another talk and this person said, well, we're giving voice to these artists and blah, blah, blah. And I said, they had a voice. They've had a voice. They were just not heard. Right. They were ignored. But their voices were always there. Their genius and, was and always there. And I have there. to say, I mean, there is a point in my career, maybe in the early 90s, I had a show at um, Friends of Photography in San Francisco. And we did a book. And I remember kind of, um, I didn't see the book. Like, they didn't give me a dummy before it was done. So I'm opening it up. And like, in the middle, they uh, printed some photographs on kind of a black background, which I was like, who gave you permission to do that? Like, why? And so I'm having in my head, like, okay, now I'm really disappointed. All of this for what? And the next thing I know, uh, the director comes over to me and I realize there's a big issue, a larger issue, that they, trustees were returning the book, not only returning the book, but um, saying that they're no longer gonna support the institution because of the show that I had and that they were um, upset about the book and upset about the programming. And it was a, like a huge problem because they were you know, saying that they were gonna take their money back and all this stuff. And so between that and then different lectures, just like we're sitting here, bomb threats in the 90s of like, you know, like, are you careful? I mean, you know, sometimes we have bomb threats, but like, you know, we, we think that it's just so, and this kind of followed me for like, three or four years. Why? It's America. I mean, it's, it's not as if what you're doing is so radical True. that it should threaten people. But it, but it was radical of the institution. You radicalized institutions. Unknowingly. <laughs> no, you didn't walk in, but, but yeah. you simply were being an artist. Yeah. You were creating and doing your work, your craft. Right. You weren't 
I'm going to walk in and radicalize this place. I'm going to blow it up. Right. You were just doing your work as an artist and showing up. Right. And there'll be a bomb threat. And so part of this is about how the act of creativity mm -hmm. for a black woman can be seen as so threatening oh, yeah. as to engender violence. Yeah. I mean. Yep. So yeah. do you feel today validated? I mean, in many ways, you are among the greatest living artists. You are at the sort of zenith of every, you have the most prestigious dealer. You have shows, the Biennale, I mean, the catalogs. I mean, all of the, do you feel that as an artist, as a black woman, mm. that things have fundamentally changed since those early days? They've changed a little bit, say, for me personally. On another level, um, kind of as an artist and during, uh, I guess, the past 15 or 20 years, it's really important for me to work with non-for-profit organizations that work with young kids who are in public schools that come to the studio. We spend the afternoon talking about, not so much about my art in a kind of art history sense, but we just sit around and talk about creativity. Um, so that kind of interaction as a, something that takes place in the studio is really important to me. Um, it's really important that I mentor uh, young people in terms of uh, the work that they are doing. Um, and I, I think like I did not come from a thing like, oh, I'm gonna make a lot of money, it's gonna be great, and I'm gonna show. I had, you know, David Hammonds was not showing in large institutions. I didn't really have an example um, that I could say in terms of contemporary art. There were no black women. There were no black women in that respect. Um, but I didn't have, there, there was something weird about it because I enjoyed making art so much. It was kind of like, there wasn't really much else I knew how, what to do. Um, so it, it's kind of, I was drawn to it, but not for any ideas around success or fame. It was really in terms of, self, as corny as that sounds, um, it was about self-expression. Right, but I mean, all the great artists, I mean, I don't know any artist who has achieved the kind of success you have who say, I started out thinking, I want to get to Hauser and Worth. But, but just, and I, no, but just to also, um, with integrity, continue to do the work I do is a grind. So, I mean, if I could say from like age 19 or 20 and all the different things that I've gone through and having to protect the integrity of the work and my practice. What does that look like? I mean, you, you say it's, I mean, most people oh, would in say. In terms of um, either, uh, like I was saying, you know, bomb threats or, um, you know, I, I remember I was getting some award in New Orleans and, uh, all the artists were um, gathered in the lobby of some hotel in New Orleans. And I, I was asked to kind of leave because I was a black woman just hanging out in the lobby. And I had to explain, I'm like, sorry, no, I'm here for the award, I'm a recipient. And so even if I go to a hotel room or I'm you know, at the thing, like, you know, when I was a younger person, um, you arrive at a hotel and they would go, oh, I'm sorry, applications? Or over there, and I'm like, no, sorry, I have a reservation. So, I mean, a grind, I mean, those are examples of like being out in the world and executing on different things that were happening. Um, but certainly in dealing with dealers or dealing with art historians or, in, or academic, dealing with different situations uh, in terms of the academy, it, it was, um, I had to have some kind of perseverance about uh, allowing myself to remain intact because there are commercial pressures to produce a certain kind of work oh, that sells. I've had dealers walk into my seal, oh, those aren't very good. You know, there was one dealer um, that I had just started doing collages. So I had framed, like the collages were, you know, they weren't hanging up, they were laying on the floor. So she's having a conversation with me in one room about how she thinks they're derivative and not very good. 
Meanwhile, while we're having that conversation, another client, because she always would double book, so there was a client waiting for her who had just bought five of them while we were having the, our conversation as to why they're not so good. And which is infuriating on you know, both levels. Like, I don't care about the person buying them. But there is a sense like, you know, sometimes dealers think they can tell you what they think about art. And you're kind of like, I was making art before you even had a gallery. Um, and so it is a grind in that way. And, but, I, but I feel like that's part of, uh, you know, it's a business. It's not, but I always try to keep separate uh, my relationship to the work and the business side of the art are kind of two different things. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the curatorial mm. system mm. that we have in this country. Yes. You're familiar with it. Yes. Our friend Thelma Golden has yeah. spoken and written extensively about a curatorial system, a system of gatekeepers, mm -hmm. because curators serve a very important role and I love curators. I, my wonderful David was a, yeah. had a curatorial background and so I'm a big, but curators are gatekeepers. Curators decide what matters and what doesn't. Right. So we have a system in this country of curators. I mean, I know of a big museum in New York on Fifth Avenue. Won't Uptown, name the name, you know, but of, yeah. there's not one black curator in the whole building. There used to be one. Yes. Yeah. But she went away. Yeah. So she retired. How do we, and that's not unusual. Right. How has that system, uh, how have you encountered that system? How have you uh, succeeded in that system? Mm -hmm. Funny that you should say that because between Kelly Jones and Thelma Golden, um, Kelly Jones, as I said before, I met when I was 18. Um, a few years, just to give a little background of how this goes and kind of how important this is to all of us, is that Kelly was working in my old neighborhood of where I grew, near where I grew up, which is Jamaica, Queens, and it was a place called Jamaica Art Center. And so this is now maybe four years or so after we met at the Studio Museum, and she's a curator of the Jamaica Art Center, and she says to me, Lorna, can you come photograph a David Hammond's piece that we have up, and you know, there's gonna be an opening, and I would help and do that. But by the way, there's this young woman I want you to meet. Her name is Thelma Golden. Kelly had hired Thelma Golden as her assistant. And I met Thelma, and it was amazing. I was like, oh, she's so young, she's so cute. And she was still, I think she was basically in college, but kind of you know, coming back and forth and living at home. And there was always this sense of community in and around that, it, well, where else would Thelma get that early, early in, right? And then she goes on to the Whitney and kind of does other things. The problem is, is that, or I should say, the beauty of what has happened, the Kelly then goes on to be an art historian and is more academically involved. I think if I, Kelly would probably kill me for saying this, but also Kelly really doesn't like the kind of commercial art system, no. which is understandable. And she has more freedom as an academic right. to write exactly. the kind of books she wants to write and what she wants to do. Um, Thelma decides to go into the beast of the museum world. And as she does that, and as she um, becomes a curator herself, the people that she then hires as interns, the people that she invites in to be her assistants are all young people of color. Every single young person of color that she has had under her wing, either at the Whitney or at the Studio Museum, are now curators at Mazur Museums. That's fantastic. But that, she's the only one. Well, and that's the problem at the same time. It is an, an impressive, and the opportunities that at an institution she gives these young people the opportunity to actually curate shows, to actually write um, uh, really academic, strong texts about artists that they are interested in in making shows. Like, really the full package. And also introducing them to other artists 
who then invite them to write for their catalogs, and it kind of becomes a circulation of, uh, of giving them opportunities. Major institutions, though, now look to Thelma as a feeding ground for new young people of color who are, of course, high above average, very well educated, and extremely um, talented, but, are, but they themselves institutionally refuse to give that opportunity themselves. And so now as we stand back and, and being in Venice, many of the curators who are at Venice, many of the artists who are in Venice, have all gone through the Studio Museum or have all gone through uh, uh, under some auspices of shows that Thelma has done at the Whitney Museum. And it does right now in 2019, you ponder or kind of go, where is the responsibility that this kind of siphoning of talent, just that she should just be the only one who bears the responsibility of creating opportunity, that it is her job at the Studio Museum, but we at these other institutions, we don't do that. We'll just wait and pick and choose. Mm -hmm. It's really um, sad and kind of inadequate at this mm -hmm. point. So one thing I often think about when I, when I think about Thelma, of course, was the uh, very brilliant, audacious uh, black male show. Yeah. And uh, what I think about actually is how the show was so savaged by many critics. But you know, in the making of it, it never occurred to anyone that it would get that savage, to be honest with you, which is, there's a beauty in that. Because she didn't worry about the reception. She didn't worry that like, oh, are critics gonna say this? Or maybe I need to think about this differently or appease in some sort of way. There was never a thought that that was gonna be a problem. And I think in fact, because she was so immersed and had the support of like Hilton jo Hilton Owls, excuse me, Hilton Owls and other writers at that time that were also close friends, it was an amazing collaborative project in that way and resource for her of, of really grounding her as a curator in terms of making something that she always really wanted to make. And so, I think she took it quite hard at that time mm -hmm. yeah. because it was kind of a shock. Well, exactly. And she was a very young curator. She was really young and it was very public and it was very New York Times, like horrible. And it was and, very and, nasty. And, and yeah, and, and well known. And racist. And racist and very well known um, art critics went after her yes. in a very racist manner, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but what did you learn from that experience? Not to question what it is you want to do not to flinch, to just stay on course and give your all to the thing that means the most to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, I mean, even in my own career, which I was also saying earlier to students, you know, critics can get it wrong, but the work kind of outlives the mm -hmm. kind of diatribe of the uh, mm -hmm. critic. And generally things come back around in a way. So while it may be a bad review or inaccurate at that particular time, it, it's kind of like you have to ignore it. You have to ignore it. So we um, have a process here of, I believe this is maybe the Stanford way, they're gonna hand out cards, um, and if we uh, will get some questions from the audience. Um, and, but, but first, um, what are we seeing here, Lauren? Oh, we're, we're Tell seeing... <laughs> us, double portrait. <laughs> well, I just thought, because I, I want it to be a flowy kind of conversation between um, Darren and I, um, but this is kind of the scope of my work, which is uh, video, uh, film, photography, uh, collage, drawings, and painting. And so I thought I'd kind of just run through, um, while we were talking, uh, the kind of gamut of the work uh, over the course of the years. And these are uh, collages from the past uh, couple of years that I've made. Um, so I've been blessed to be able to kind of go down all these different avenues and uh, take risk. Um, and I think in some ways as a curator or as an artist or as a professional, and I'm sure, you know, Darren, in terms of the work that you do, if I may ask a question, 
How do you stay on course? How, in the, in the light of all the resistance to even statistical evidence of the need for change, how do you still continue to move forward and to kind of manage dealing with institutions and individuals who are resistant? Well, I think that in philanthropy, um, there is a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And the resistance comes from the, uh, the innate uh, uh, imbalance um, of power and resources. Mm -hmm. So the wealthy and wealthy philanthropies, wealthy institutions, uh, tend to believe that we're right. And all of the incentives in society uh, reinforce that because people don't tell rich people what they think of them. Mm. And people don't tell people in big foundations what they think of them because we have a system where there is more reliance on private wealth mm -hmm. for public good. Yeah. And so that causes private wealth to be privileged. Yeah. And we've all been there, right? I mean, I was in a board meeting recently of a well-known cultural institution with, you know, more than its fair share of billionaires on the board. And, you know, the people can just say the most absurd things. And you're sitting at the board table, and this person says something that is completely absurd and asinine. And no one says, like, that's, like, really stupid. Yeah. That's, like, really stupid. Well, I, I am a board member of a couple of museums, and I have that voice. Well, this is why we need artists. <laughs> but, but this yeah. is my point yeah. that I'm getting to. There are fewer and fewer of those boards looking for artists or looking for people who bring anything other than wealth. And if you look at so many institutions that used to have, uh, I mean, I remember I used to be on the board of New York City Ballet, and there was a time when we had former dancers, we had sort of dance historian types. I mean, there's sort of funky, I mean, there was a very sort of a loosey-goosey arts kind of part of the board, that, that's gone. Yeah. I mean, because nominating governance, the candidate pipeline is all about who's wealthy. And I've certainly had conversations with trustees of big museums who have uh, despaired at how board recruitment is much less about connoisseurship, uh, appreciation for art, deep collecting than it is who's rich mm -hmm. and who was it who bought that Jeff Koons because we want to get him on the board, right? So, so that the ideology is infecting uh, our systems and those systems um, are oxygenated by creative energy and creativity and many of these people and institutions are, in, in spite of the rhetoric, conservative, right? And I think, so to fight against that, to push against that. Um, or there's no spirit of public service. Well, the, it's, it's the, the spirit of public service is, you know, this is what I like to collect the public ought to like this. <laughs> no, I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's this is what I ought to collect. This is what I collect and the public ought to appreciate this. Right. And, and so I think the issue of uh, what is the public interest is increasingly conflated mm -hmm. with the private interest right. of wealthy donors and patrons because our institutions and the system so relies, and it's one of the reasons I write about and talk about how pernicious this notion that everything that matters in our society is a function of capital. And I think it's 
great. And I'm an advocate um, for black artists, for example, mm -hmm. um, getting paid, okay? Mm -hmm. So I want those prices at Christie's and Phillips to be, but on an, another part of me says, this can't be about capital, right? right? This can't just, just be, about be about auction that. prices. Right. Because if that's what we value, um, what we ought to value is the humanity of the artist and the role of artists, because artists in a society like this are more necessary, because artists will hold the mirror up to us and will demand that we look in that mirror. And for privileged people and privileged institutions, we have the privilege of not having to look in the mirror, because most people don't want to hold that mirror up to us. And, and so to talk about that and engage on, in, in, in that discourse is something that I think we all have to do, but it's yeah. very hard to do it. Yeah, agreed. Be... So, so, oh great, Harry's got questions for us. And the first one is actually for you, Darren, and, and relates to what you were uh, just getting at. What is the role of philanthropy and concentrated wealth in solving issues of social justice like inequality and, and how does art figure in that? Great question. Well, um, I think the whole question of what the role of philanthropy is uh, is a fundamentally um, contested idea today um, because I think I'm writing a book that will be out in the fall, and it is called The New Gospel of Wealth, and mm. The New Gospel of Wealth from Generosity to Justice. And what it, um, the frame of the book is Andrew Carnegie's seminal 1889 essay, The Gospel of Wealth, which basically is the seminal foundational document of American philanthropy, in which he says that philanthropy's role is uh, to provide charitable support, to have people like himself and John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, et cetera, uh, give out money um, in uh, a way that um, helps uh, reduce uh, the, the, the misery of, of poor and, and uh, under, uh, under disadvantaged people. Mm -hmm. And so what I use as the basis of the, my book is, is uh, what Dr. King said in 1968 to a group of philanthropists, which is the following. Philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the very injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what Dr. King was saying was a very different thing than Carnegie. Mm -hmm. What Carnegie was saying, and he wrote explicitly, that inequality was just basically a byproduct and, and it was, there was nothing wrong with inequality. The issue was, what would men like him do with all of this wealth that they had and that they should be generous? What I say is actually that inequality is harmful and the, the levels of inequality that we see in our society today is harmful and it is actually uh, harmful to our democracy and harmful to our democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard though to engage in that discourse because the very beneficiaries of that inequality are therefore expected to fix it, right? I mean, and so how do you engage with a group of uh, how do you walk into a room uh, of the giving pledge and say, um, I know all of you people are successful, but the very system that created your wealth it's is problem. very problematic. <laughs> and, and how do we fix that system so there aren't as many of you in the future, right? <laughs> so, and, and, and I say that about my own institution, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is very much, we are all a product and inequality, of course, in a, in a system like ours, there's always gonna be inequality. So it's not as if inequality on the face of it is wrong. It's that the level of inequality that we have, the level of concentrated wealth is, uh, is so problematic 
And, and so the challenge is, and what I struggle with, is how to engage in that conversation with philanthropy. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it's essential because we are starting to see um, the critique of philanthropy. And that critique is not coming from where it has traditionally come from, which is conservatives. I mean, I'm often, well, not often, but occasionally, you know, at some conversation like this, and someone, when it's time to ask a question, goes to the microphone and says, you know, I can't believe what the Ford Foundation is doing. Um, Henry Ford is turning over in his grave that you all are, you know, and I mean, I always say, you know, look, lady, I mean, Henry Ford is turning over in his grave a whole lot of things. I mean, there's a black gay man who's president of the Ford Foundation. I mean, there are like so many, I mean, like, the, I mean, if you do, I mean, when people, that, that always happens at least, right? It always happens inevitably at some, and, but part of what, she was, it was getting at was, you know, Henry Ford was a capitalist and, and, you know, but Henry Ford also was the first industrialist to name inequality as a problem. And it's why he said he had to pay his auto workers. They couldn't afford the Model T. And he said, I've got to pay my workers enough. Now he had some real issues around labor ultimately, but at <laughs> least on this issue, he named inequality. Um, but today, you get a group of, and it's happened to me on many, many, many occasions, so I can say it now with some, you get a group of very successful, very wealthy men, primarily, in a room and you talk, try to talk about this and they become incredibly defensive because for them, it is essential to believe that we're a meritocracy, that the system is fair because the system worked for them. They're billionaires. The system worked. So what do you mean you're telling me that the system isn't fair? I worked hard. My father didn't have a high school degree. I mean, I've heard every story, you know? And, um, and so how dare you accuse me of, you know, benefiting um, from white male privilege? Um, I had no privilege. I started with nothing. I mean, I've heard all of those narratives. Um, and so it is, that's the hard part for me. Thank you. Lorna, this question is for you. Yeah. Earlier work seemed once defined by edges, frames, figures, black, white. Now there is flow, water, colors. Was there something that changed in, in your life? Um, what helped this occur? And, and, and actually, where do you see your art going in the future? Um, well, you know, I, I am older. Um, if, if, if thinking of myself as starting as an artist, um, let's say, I don't know, 20 years old, um, certainly some 30 years, some odd years later, the work is going to change and shift. I mean, I feel that um, I am at my best when I am unsure. I am at my best when I am not so certain about the work that I'm making or that it is something new or even unfamiliar to me. Um, I don't believe that making art should be comfortable and systematic in a certain kind of way. Um, so it is always evolving. Um, and I also kind of circling back to certain genres, circling, circling back maybe to video, <clears throat> work soon. Um, but your work is always what I've loved about watching your career is how your work has so evolved mm -hmm. and how you have been able to incorporate all of these different media. I mean, there are lots of artists who, I mean, their show that's up now looks like the first show you saw. I mean, mm -hmm. have they been doing right, that? Yeah. They, they get like, and this is maybe where the dealers come in, I mean, they get like a formula and then like literally they're just doing a different color today than they were 30 right. years ago. <laughs> right, true. I mean, I, I, I think I um, always feel like being challenged is good and I, um, as I was also thinking about, you know, being an artist, you cannot be risk adverse. Right? It, it, there has to be some level of discomfort or risk or that you don't know uh, whether or not it's going to be good, but failure can, or fear cannot uh, drive the kind of creative process. Um, but I also feel like I, that is a privilege. I feel like I have the privilege of kind of making the kind of life I'd like to make. I have the privilege to make the kind of work that I'd like to make. Um, and that feels really good. And over these decades, um, that's really important for me to protect. Um, but that isn't really important to my artistic uh, expression. 
This one is for both of you. Um, can you step into the mire of the recent controversy around the museum, uh, where the museum's money comes from? How can we navigate a future where there is far less funding for museums in the US as we reject funds from the makers of pills, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think, as Darren was saying, kind of the lack of that there are public institutions are privately funded. We do not have a kind of more European system where it is governments funded, right? Or uh, the state funds uh, these institutions. So I even remember from the days of the National Endowment of the Arts and the kind of collapse of uh, that kind of support really then became this whole era of private support of public institutions. Once you go down that path, which we are way down that path now, of course there are going to be issues with individuals who are on boards who give a lot of money and the problematics of like, you know, tear gas canisters, canisters with the names of, you know, the company uh, that a particular trustees on, on a particular uh, institution, you know, sits on the board. And so uh, because everything is now funneled into private support, this is going to hemorrhage. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it, it, it again is a function of the growing inequality. And so that's the diagnosis. The, 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 the point that I would make is it's not too late. I mean, I think, I think, you know, there, there ought to be more public funding for the arts. There ought to be more mechanisms that bring more public revenue to bear in, in terms of the arts ecosystem. And I, I really do think that we are going to see more of this mm -hmm. because the necessity of the cost of operating these institutions mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, need and the competitiveness, particularly of the signature ones, to grow and to build new wings and to operate broader programs, and to operate more public education programs, right. because in fairness, they're all of their education programs, I mean, when I look at the education program at MoMA, for example, it's amazing right. how, many, how much that education program has expanded. I mean, it's expanded because of private giving, not because the city right. of New York is funding right. it to expand. Um, so there, there, is, there are absolutely upsides to that, but then the downsides yeah. are that the integrity of the institution is compromised. Because we know the public today, it's just a different time. I mean, it's hard to remember that John D. Rockefeller was the most reviled man of his era. I mean, that, you know, I mean, tear gas cans. I mean, this man blew up an entire town looking for oil and like paid off the justice system so no one at Standard Oil would get prosecuted. I mean, so, you know, and today, Rockefeller is the gold standard. Right. in philanthropy, right? So um, I want to be fair, but on the other hand, social media didn't exist in 1913. It sure did. And, <laughs> and so the, the uh, willingness and patience of the public, and we are a more democratic, inclusive society, you know, John D. Rockefeller and, John, uh, and, and Andrew Carnegie, Morgan, I mean, they could all say, so what, that these little people don't like Whatever, I mean, who cares? They're, today you can't do that. It's, it's, we're a much more, thank goodness, we are a much more inclusive society than we were 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. This one picks up on your point of the social media and it's for both of you again. Has the inter internet um, changed the way you think about your sources and circulation of your work or what you do in terms of philanthropy? Do you think the internet has the capacity to level the field or diminish the role of gatekeepers? Or does the ubiquity of images simply reinforce their importance? I actually feel like over the past 10 years that um, particularly with, with the, I'll just leave it in the context of art. <laughs> um, uh, certainly in terms of uh, political action, the internet has been amazing mm -hmm. on many levels. Mm -hmm. But particularly in terms of art, for young people in communities that are very isolated, the internet is this world into feeling uh, that you can see a mirror of yourself, you can see people like you when you're, if you're living in a community that despises you. And so 
I think it has the capacity to kind of open worlds for young people that are in situations that are uh, completely isolated and kind of, uh, of not of their own choosing. Um, so in that way, um, it can kind of build community and also build uh, in terms of uh, resources, in terms of uh, literature, in terms of looking at art and what are other artists doing in a way of sharing that, that I think is really important. At the same time, I guess, I mean, I think institutionally, it does affect the, the nature of the museum because while I think it's important to see a work in person, it's also important to know that it exists. So I would say, you know, it can act as a vehicle mm -hmm. to get someone to kind of uh, visit a museum or an opportunity to travel if possible. There is a kind of aspirational aspect to it, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it takes away from actually having the physical piece and visiting that. That's like the next step. Um, but I think it actually kind of opens worlds in a way. What I worry about is a broader issue of the internet in society when you, so if we're a foundation focused on justice, um, the internet is highly problematized, right? Because the, uh, the internet has been privatized. Mm. And Tim Berners-Lee's original idea for the web, which would be, was this idea Tim was on the Ford board for many years, um, was this utopian idea of connecting people and it all being free in, um, when in fact uh, the internet has been privatized, the systems of monetizing data, our data, uh, have created huge wealth and are very challenging when you think about the public interest because in every sphere of life, American life, we know what the public interest is. Um, but I like to think, for example, the Zuckerberg hearings were, it was the intersection of democracy and capitalism and, and, commerce, yeah. and democracy lost mm -hmm. and part of the reason democracy lost was because one the capacity to articulate and advocate advocate on behalf of the public interest was not there was not so possible. we had congress people yeah. asking almost idiotic questions <laughs> And there was on the on, on social media there were all these memes and comical things being I mean about the senator turning on his I mean it was just <laughs> yes but but in but the yeah. in any other sphere of American life the environment financial services health global development there would be sitting behind those Congress people smart people with credentials and training who would be passing them yeah. index cards the saying. No, he's wrong. Ask him this. Mm -hmm. Here's the data you need to recite. There was no one sitting behind them yeah. because there is very little capacity working on behalf of the people. And so what has happened is pub the public interest in this new digital world has basically been ceded to private interests right. to tell us what the public interest is. So you decide what the private interest is, and then whatever is left over is what we will, the public will have. And, and so if you decide that you want all our data and our information, you can have it and monetize it. And the regulations are very, very light. If you decide in all the things that are happening in the analog world that are very, pro so let's just take something very straightforward like predatory lending and payday lending. Mm -hmm. In the analog world, we know that happens a lot, right? The whole idea of just predatory mortgages. In this new digital world, without regulation, and because programs can be created and AI is so amazing and brilliant and fantastic and pernicious all at the same time, you can create a program in the city of Cincinnati that goes to census tract level with every black person in that city. Mm -hmm. And you can 
create a, a data set and you can sell that and that the buyer of that can bombard all of those people with predatory mortgage products, can send them constantly, here's the mortgage you need for your housing. And, and it's done, it's very hard to regulate, it is... And hard to track. And it, it, is, it is hard to track, track, but it can be tracked and it can be prevented. But who's, who's working to do that? Right. Now the FCC, and the, but, but they're all behind. I mean, this is the amazing thing about AI and about how fast this is all happening. It would take a year to figure out how to do that, mm -hmm. right? To at the census tract level, in an entire city, figure out where the black people live, right? Or to, as Latanya Sweeney, a, a professor at Harvard We Fund, had demonstrated recently how this program that, that she'd found buys, aggregates black names, and it aggregates black names on the internet and finds those names and then seeks to sell them, um, sell ads to bail bondsmen, uh, payday lenders, I mean, all of those things. And high, she showed, high percentage right, credit and she cards. Showed yeah. how, and she showed how it's all done and how there's a huge multi, hundreds of millions of dollars that are being made in this new digital era with very little protection, very little oversight. And that's a problem because that's happening on the internet. So all the things, the, the potential of the internet to be what you just described, right? right? Yeah. This connector. Which, which is why I kept right? it to this, just No, but still, in the, yeah. it's, it, because it is that. Yeah. It does do that. Yeah. But it also does this. Right. And Absolutely. this is very problematic and this is what we, the people, need to have our government with computer scientists and yeah. word uh, code writers and all those people who do this work here on Stanford and other working on our behalf. So where are they in government? Where are they at the FCC, the FTC? Where are they in state government? How do we hire computer scientists to work on the public interest? And so it's one of the reasons why we're creating, we're working at Ford and with lots of others to build a whole new sector called public interest technology. And Stanford, I'm happy to say, is gonna be one of those universities working with us. I see last question. Yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> what is your sense of the relationship between artists and market? How do you feel, for instance, about the fact that so much art news is about uh, auction prices? It's always been about auction prices. Um, how do I feel about that? I mean, it's a commercial entity, uh, the art world. It, it doesn't run just on, oh, I'm gonna make a painting or I'm gonna make a drawing and that's it. Um, I, I think that's always been the case. In some ways, um, you know, the, as an artist, there's a danger, right, of believing one's auction prices. So if you look at a young artist who is getting maybe incredible prices uh, in terms of auction, the danger for them is that if you try to approach that in the uh, primary market and it crashes, you're really, really in bad trouble in terms of selling any work, mm -hmm. which means you have to roll back your prices, um, which means you gut your own market. So, I mean, as an artist, it's kind of like you kind of operate in your own lane. You kind of operate in a way that you don't take the kind of commodity and auction house prices seriously with regard to one's own primary market and kind of leave that somewhat to the secondary market. But you can't kind of engage it or um, completely embrace it because it's, there's, it's, spec, it's speculation and that can always turn badly. Do you want to answer that, or um, uh, in terms, Darren, for, for you then, you painted this world in, in terms of the future and thinking about technology within the future world. I'm wondering what you think as to art's potential impact on that vision you talked about. Now, like you mentioned at Stanford, we have a new initiative in human-centered AI, um, and one of the things that that uh, initiative is going to do is it's going to have an embedded artist who works with AI. So. Well, Thoughts I mean, I, look, I think um, as someone who um, worries about injustice in our society, um, we need a more 
empathetic society. Mm. You only get empathy through the arts and the humanities. I mean, so we actually can't have more justice without more artists, without more humanities, without more understanding of our human experience, right? And so there are people out there in the world who, when you look at them and you see their total lack of humanity, their just vileness and their crudeness and their sense of where is your humanity? I mean, how can you speak about other human beings with no sense of their humanity, with no ability to possibly put yourself in their shoes? You know that person has never taken an art humanities course. You know they've never been to a museum. I mean, no, you know that, that they that they they don't read. They that, don't read. They don't. And and what they read is right. I mean, they read, but they don't. They, they don't. read. They read business magazines, or they read. But so they read, but they would. What they don't do is. Or they read their own tweets. They have tweets. never. They have never <laughs> had. They have never had fomented in them any. Empathy, and empathy is among the most important mm -hmm. developmental things that a human being needs to be successful and to contribute to humanity, right? And, and so you don't, you don't have to have empathy. I mean, I'm, and there are people who don't. Obviously, we can see that every day. Yeah. But... But we have to have a society where there is more empathy because a society with less empathy will be a society where there is less justice, there is more inhumanity, there's more injustice. And so the role of the arts in fomenting, engendering, Encouraging. Well, in the formation of fascism, art is the first thing to go. Yes, hmm. always, hmm. always. And artists are the greatest threat. Right. Thank you both very much. <laughs> thank you to Lorna Simpson. Thank you, Darren Walker, for being with us. And thank you all for your questions as well. <laughs>